We are live in YouTube. We are live in YouTube. We are going live in five, four, three, two. We are live in our webinar. Okay, great. We'll just give it a minute for everybody to join. Okay, uh, let's get started with today's session. Uh, welcome everybody again for November's uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Sym Symposium. We have a very uh, special guest tonight and, and very excited to introduce him. Uh, but before that, let's just get through uh, the introductions here. Uh, my name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the Brain Tumor and Scoby Surgeons here at the University of Miami and I direct our research program. And I'm joined by my co-directors of this symposium, uh, Dr. Komatar, Professor and Program Director of the residency program, Dr. Morcos, professor and co-chairman of our, of our department and director of cerebrovascular and skull base, and Dr. Benjamin, who is a director of our radio surgery program and director of our skin, arcane skull base lab. Uh, each week we put on, or each month we put on these as the 42nd one since COVID started. And uh, many, many thanks goes to all the administrators to help us from the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, the University of Miami and the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, without them, uh, we wouldn't be able to do, provide these uh, symposiums. Uh, again, anything you want to know about either this symposium, our department, or future encounters, please check us out on the web and social media. Uh, rounding out uh, some of the other conferences happening uh, on our neurosurgery uh, site in the month of November is we have one on Monday uh, from our pediatric symposium looking at pediatric head injury. Um, and so please check that out. It'll be from 5 to 6 p.m. And then uh, our cerebrovascular and skull base symposium, which will be the next one will be on Thursday, November 18th. We'll be talking about acoustic neuromas and petroclival meningiomas as hard as it gets with, with a, a great group of panels there led by uh, Dr. Morcos and the rest of the skull base team here. 
Uh, and then also just a reminder, our next uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium will be Wednesday, December 1st. Uh, for housekeeping, again, we try to make this as interactive as possible. We'll have a great talk tonight, but please use the Q&A button as much as you can to try to interact with us, and we'll try to get to all of your questions uh, throughout or at the end of the tonight's uh, symposium. Uh, we, we, we welcome our, our panelists this week, uh, the trio of the Miami uh, Neuro Oncology Fellows, uh, Dr. Higgins from Columbia, Dr. Patel, who has a, a very um, uh, relationship with tonight's speaker, and, and I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit more about that in just a moment, and Dr. Cater, all fantastic uh, neuro uh, surgeons who we're lucky enough to have working with this year. I'm going to let Nitesh uh, give tonight's introduction um, and, uh, and, and take over. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Ivan. How's it going, Dr. Bookbar? How are you? Good evening, Nitesh. Be gentle. Be uh, kind. Of course. I mean, I can see your office hasn't changed much since I was there. The <laughs> lava rock thing is still there. Um, you know, for everyone, it's really something special for me to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Bookbar uh, for our Miami Global Brain Tumor uh, Symposium today. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do an enfolded fellowship with him and Dr. Langer as a fifth year neurosurgery resident um, at Lenox Hill Hospital. Um, Dr. Bukvar was, you know, amazing. He quickly became not only a mentor, but also a friend. Um, you know, he serves as the vice chairman of neurosurgery at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City, but also as professor of neurosurgery at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University. Um, on top of that, he also runs a basic science lab all the way out in Cold Spring Harbor. And he managed to do this all while still maintaining an amazing family life. Um, he's a favorite among students who shadow Lenox Hill. I mean, he would have armies of students coming by all the time. Uh, the neurosurgery residents there, uh, the faculty staff all loved him. Um, you can even catch him starring on the hit Netflix show uh, titled Lenox Hill. Uh, check it out. You really will give you a glimpse into Dr. Bookvar's incredible work at Lenox Hospital. Um, so with that, you know, Dr. Bookvar, you know, thanks again. Um, thanks for training me and uh, thanks for coming by today to give us our, our, our talk today. Well, Nitesh, uh, Michael <clears throat> and Ricardo, thank you so much for having me. An absolute pleasure to have friends uh, down south and um, it's just an honor to uh, present our data today. So first I'm gonna hopefully share my screen successfully and give me one moment. How's that look, Ditesh? Looks good. So actually, I hope you don't mind, um, as all of us have had busy days in the operating room. Uh, I too love a very interactive session. And um, I'm going to really just skip all the basics, if that's all right with you, Michael, and sort that's of great. jump jump to sort of what pains me every day and really what pains us as providers. And and how do we overcome the blood-brain barrier to improve treatments for our patients? So I'm just gonna cut to the chase. I, I literally skipped about 19 introductory slides and I hope that's okay. Um, and this way I can get to sort of questions and answers because every time I give a talk like this, to me, it's a cry for help. It's a cry for help in asking you guys to sort of take some ideas that you know, Nitesh knows that we're doing and see if you guys can contribute meaningfully to some of our clinical trials and, clin and basic research. But I'm gonna introduce you to some background and I'm gonna start with the cancer stem cell hypothesis. The cancer stem cell hypothesis in GBM is not new, but it actually overlapped a little bit with my training at Penn and sort of you know, got me interested in the idea that you can see here in this ball in A that there are little orange cells that we call CSCs or cancer stem cells. And in the middle, you see that there's only a few of those cells and that the majority of the tumor is actually differentiated non-cancer stem-like cells. But we give radiation and chemotherapy here as a yellow um, lightning bolt. And then we're left with these residual cancer stem cells. And after time, we have a tumor that regenerates and you have relapse. So should we be looking at targeting these orange cells with an orange lightning bolt, as you see here in B, and actually using that therapy alone just to target the cancer stem-like cell? It may on MRI not show much of a difference on the on the MRI, but actually over time, that tumor will degenerate and you may be able to actuate cure. Or do you combine the cancer stem-like cell treatment 
with your basic standard treatment and actuate remission and ultimate cure. So that's sort of just an idea. And I, for a long time, both at Cornell and now at my lab at Coles from Harvard Laboratories, which is part of Northwell Health and the Zucker School of Medicine, I've been interested in harnessing these tumor stem-like cells from all glioblastoma patients, growing them and studying them. In fact, if you're interested in uh, you know biotech, there's a big um, push into this cancer stem-like world uh, as well. And in fact, one of our cancer stem-like uh, companies is Stemline Therapeutics, which is looking at targeting these cancer stem line uh, stem cells uh, to treat our, our patients' tumors. If I want you to focus on a single slide, this is one of them. Can you guys see this slide okay? Yes. This cancer stem-like cell is hugging the perivascular stem cell niche. And it's these green cells that I'm trying to target in our patients' uh, glioblastomas. And this quote, which is not my own, really sums up my approach to the treatment of glioblastoma. The perivascular stem cell niche protects the cancer stem cell. So targeting these microenvironments can provide a highly effective treatment of cancer. But how the heck do we find and target these very small cancer stem-like cells that are hiding in the perivascular stem cell niche. So this is a model of a brain tumor next to a blood vessel. Here you can see a blood vessel, you can see a cancer stem cell hugging that perivascular stem cell niche. And over time, those stem-like cells differentiate and grow into a, a full-grown tumor. This is a old model of a, a perivascular stem cell niche in cancer. It actually gets more confusing because over time we know that the, not only is there this picture where you have blood vessels and the cancer stem cell, but you actually have a layer of pericytes now that actually are in between your blood brain barrier and that cancer stem like cell. And actually, if we look at survival of patients who have high numbers of parasites stuck to their endothelial cells, those patients have a shorter survival than patients with low numbers of pericytes. So I just want to actually bring this paper to your attention that depending upon the number of parasites that are next to these blood vessels, the higher number of parasites lead to lower survival in patients who are given chemotherapy. This is just an incredibly underthought of uh, uh, method of uh, affecting our treatments. So in fact, if we looked at all of our patients and their endothelial cell tight junctions and the blood brain barrier, if you have pericytes here, um, you're gonna have a harder time getting drugs through the blood brain barrier. And, and treating our patients. For all the students out there, if you want a great project, study the blood-brain barrier. We learned about the blood-brain barrier over 120 years ago from jaundice patients. Why do we learn uh, from jaundice patients? Because every organ at autopsy was yellow except the brain. And that's because Billy Rubin never penetrated the blood-brain barrier. But this is an understudied uh, impedance to our treatment of patients uh, with the uh, brain tumors. And I'm not going to dive into all the mechanisms of what make the blood brain barrier difficult, but here it is essentially, like we talked about, you have an endothelial cell with its tight junctions, you have astrocytic foot processes. And of course, now you have this pericyte. To me, the pericyte was a cell in medical school, like that we never studied. It was kind of just like glossed over, but in actuality, it's probably much more important uh, than we ever gave it credit for. And there's a whole host of modalities to bypass the blood-brain barrier. Guys like Mike Vogelbaum are looking at convection-enhanced delivery. Henry Bram and others at Hopkins uh, exploited the use of uh, gliadel. We are focusing on this modality, which is intra-arterial drug um, permeability by giving osmotic diuretics to break open the interendothelial cell tight junctions and taking drug from inside the lumen of the blood vessel and getting it into our uh, patient's brain tumors. Why? Because I want you to remember that right next to this blood vessel are those green cells that we call uh, glioblastoma stem cells. This is going to be where the perivascular stem cell niche is. Again, there's been a whole host, and I don't want to focus on this, but there's been a lot of people trying to improve upon blood-brain barrier penetration uh, for drug delivery. I can tell you where the puck is going. I really like the use of focus ultrasound um, as a safe way to disrupt the blood-brain barrier. Again, we're using osmotic agents uh, like mannitol, which give a transient disruption of the blood-brain barrier. But Michael looks like he's got his pensive uh, thinking mode on. So I know he's asking the question, John, isn't the blood-brain barrier already disrupted in glioblastoma? And the answer is 
Not necessarily. It's heterogeneously disrupted. There are portions on our contrast enhancing MRI scan that show that gadolinium does get through the blood brain barrier, but those pores are actually rather large. But the majority of tumor burden exists actually behind an intact blood brain barrier. And we know this by T2 flare signaling and by uh, PET imaging. So I want you to understand that yes, there are portions that have. Um, some disruption of the blood-brain barrier, but actually the majority of our brain tumors have a large uh, blood, blood tumor barrier, blood-brain barrier to overcome. I took this from Charlie Wilson, <clears throat> and this is just, uh, just to remind you that looking at the history, particularly when you're exploring new ideas in medicine, is a good way to um, you know, check, fact check your ideas. But Charlie Wilson showed that the further you get away from a tumor, the fewer cells you have. So the core here that has a uh, disrupted blood-brain barrier may be right here where you see contrast enhancement. But the further you get away uh, from that tumor is where that tumor burden is gonna have an intact blood-brain barrier, even to the contralateral hemisphere. All right, so on to our clinical trials and how that brief background dovetails um, to our clinical trial. So here is a 60, here is a 62 year old male who presents with this a right handed male who presents with this left thalamic lesion. Okay, now this is an IDH wild type uh, MGMT promoter unmethylated GBM in a 62 year old. Michael, what do you tell your patients the prognosis is for for this type of newly diagnosed GBM? Yeah, I mean. I mean, obviously, it's it's difficult to give the exact uh, day or week of prognosis, but um, you know, this is the worst kind of mutational status you could have, and, yeah. and so the literature will support anything between you know, you know fourteen months uh, with deeper structures like this in the thalamus. I'd probably say less than that. Yeah, and that's exactly what I said to him. He's a teacher, um, and you're exactly right. IDH, based on the 2021 brain tumor classifications, um, this is a you know sort of classic glioblastoma. You know, we, he underwent a clinical trial where we give intraarterial bevacizumab to deplete the cancer stem cell niche. And this is his scan six years later off of treatment. And so I'm going to walk you through why I think we're able to achieve this. And uh, Nitesh uh, just um, uh, wrote this up and we're fortunate to get it published in uh, Journal of Neurocology. I think, Nitesh, this is the cover article for the upcoming uh, uh, journal. So the trial is we give three doses of intraarterial bevacizumab right before we start STU protocol at three months and at six months. And then we stop our intraarterial bevacizumab. And the reason why we are giving intraarterial bevacizumab is there's preclinical data that suggests that, that bevacizumab depletes that green cell that I showed you in that picture of stem cells in the perivascular niche. And by giving our high dose of intraarterial BEV, we're depleting that perivascular stem cell niche of cancer stem-like cells. So this patient, after completing 12 months of temozolomide and six weeks of chemo uh, therapy and radiation, was able to get off decadron and still alive um, with this lesion almost seven years later. Okay, so he has been off treatment, no treatment for this thalamic lesion uh, for four and a half years. Now, we under speak about this topic of minimal residual disease or MRD and other cancers based on this uh, mouse model. There is a time in every disease where we have minimal residual disease, whether it's breast cancer, colon cancer, or brain cancer. And for us, minimal residual disease is after radi surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And you can see that down here after this uh, tumor surgery, which is here optional in the mouse, uh, with radiation and temozolomide, we have a point where each of us as surgeons and as neurooncologists can achieve MRD in our patients with GBM. And I just remind you, and I keep coming back to that picture, MRD is when the cancer stem cell population is at its lowest. And so I bring back this slide again, because this is like the slide that keeps me up at night. At MRD, glioma stem-like cells reside in this brain tumor perivascular stem cell niche. So I need at MRD to kill every last glioma stem-like cell if possible. And we know that MRD, that these 
glioma stem-like cells release high levels of VEGF. This data is, is clear. Cancer stem-like cells, release, they have high levels of VEGF receptors and they release a lot of VEGF and that leads to their resistance to radiation. In fact, in some of the preclinical work, this is not mine, that in preclinical animal models, they gave neural stem-like cells bevacizumab, which is a Vastin, and completely depleted uh, that, that um, broth, if you will, the media of uh, uh, soluble VEGF. So we know that bevacizumab depletes cancer stem-like cells of VEGF. And this paper came out in 2007, and this sort of jump-started my whole idea. And I mentioned this before, that bevacizumab, which is a Vastin, a drug that you and I all have access to, gets rid of stem-like cells in the, in the niche in glioma orthotopic xenografts. And so if we can achieve that, what they're achieving here in mice and humans, we're again using a drug that is FDA approved. As long as we get a high enough dose concentration, this is the hypothesis. Get this drug into the perivascular stem cell niche. It's been proven in mice. We're going to prove it in humans. In addition, this article came out that shows that high dose of bevacizumab is not just anti-angiogenic. It's actually tumoricidal. What does that mean? At higher doses, I highlighted here at the bottom, dose is equivalent to 15 milligrams per kilogram, which by the way, is the dose that we give our patients, leads to relevant tumor cell regression in addition to the vascular actions of the drug, meaning that at higher doses, this drug kills tumor cells. It's not just an anti-angiogenic. It's not just normalizing the blood-brain barrier. All right, so what is the idea that I came up with? How do we take all this preclinical information and we can structure this perivascular stem cell niche. So this is the idea. I have this perivascular stem cell niche. I have an anti-angiogenic drug called Avastin now that can actually impair cancer stem cell renewal. I just can't get it through my blood-brain barrier. It's too big. It's 150,000 dollars. So I'm going to have to use intra-arterial mannitol to break down the blood-brain barrier, get this drug into the perivascular stem cell niche, and let's see if this works. So this trial was called Selective Repeated Intraarterial Blood-Brain Barrier Disruption with High-Dose Intraarterial Bevacizumab. And again, the idea here is to stick a microcatheter as far up into the arterial tree, disrupt the blood-brain barrier with intraarterial mannitol, give high doses of this drug at a concentration in preclinical models we know depletes the cancer stem cell niche, and then see if it's safe. And of course, like you guys have in Miami, we have, uh, and we had at Cornell, we have very talented interventional neuroradiology colleagues and neurosurgical colleagues that really know how to do this very quickly and very rapidly. So we opened our interventional neuro-oncology suite to explore these ideas using microcatheters. And here you can see David Langer and Rafael Ortiz actually thinking about what vessels are going to be targeted based on the distribution of our tumor. So here's that case, Michael, that you, you know, saw earlier. And this is the vessels that they chose. You see the left thalamic flare signal abnormality. They're looking at the medial and posterior lateral, um, the, the, the posterior medial and lateral uh, chordal vessels here. And they're giving high doses of bevacizumab after blood brain barrier into this tumor uh, as part of our clinical trial. Here's another recent case that we did. I just like this picture because you can see the microcatheter selectively targeting uh, one area where the tumor, I just removed the tumor about 30 days earlier. So this is selective catheterization of um, vessels that are include the contrast enhancing area plus about two centimeters of margin, which is the same um, and the flare signal abnormality, which is the same way we target um, um, radiation. Um, tell me if you guys can hear this okay. This is just another picture of it. You can see this is the vertebral artery, and he's snaking this catheter up. So that's just a, a picture just to show you how we do these. And again, um, I've been doing this for over a decade now. We started at Cornell with Howard Arena and the group there um, to show that the phase one dose was safe. 
uh, when I moved over here, we were, and we showed that in recurrent GBM, it not only was safe, but a single dose led to uh, median progression free survival that, that showed there was a, a good signal here. And as we moved over here, when I came over to Northwell and to Lenox Hill Hospital, we were able to continue that work and exploit uh, some of this um, really durable response uh, that we were seeing in our patients. But I, I really have been thinking about this idea of minimal residual disease again. And I said, well, why don't we capture that moment of MRD and move this very powerful treatment to patients with upfront glioblastoma? And yes, I know that there have been IV Avastin papers that have not shown improvement, and we'll talk about that. But remember, the reason to use a high-dose BEV upfront is that our goal is to increase that cancer stem cell persister cell killing at the time of MRD. And actually, there are, there are other studies that show that Avastin is a uh, potent uh, radiosensitizer. So just to acknowledge that the use of biweekly IV bevacizumab in conjunction with two protocol, improved progression-free survival, but did not improve overall survival. So it's fallen out of favor. Although in the treatment group with IV BEV, there was a lower steroid requirement uh, than um, without bevacizumab. I will say that this is one of the most important papers that I never wrote. And this paper came out of Hopkins that basically showed what I've been showing in humans. They showed it in mice that there is a distinct advantage to intraarterial delivery of bevacizumab when you use it in conjunction with blood-brain barrier opening, meaning that if you give IV bevacizumab and you don't open the blood-brain barrier, or if you give IA bevacizumab and you don't open the blood-brain barrier, it's much less effective, meaning that if you want to get high doses of drugs like bevacizumab, which includes cetuximab, which is EGFR monoclonal antibody, trastuzumab, which is a HER2 monoclonal antibody, anything that's big, you better disrupt that blood-brain barrier or else it's not going to get in. So here's our trial, and then I'll get to our data. So I'm targeting this area of MRD, minimal residual disease. I do surgery on the patient. They get a dose of intraarterial BEV, and then six weeks of chemotherapy and radiation. They take a month off, and then they start their uh, maintenance temozolomide. They get a second dose of IA BEV at uh, 30 days, uh, I'm sorry, three months, and then at six months, and then they stop. So uh, Nitesh and our team, we screened 31 patients. The trial was designed to evaluate repeated dosing of intraarterial drug delivery. That earlier trial that I showed you with Howard um, was a single dose. This is the first trial we did with repeated dosing. 23 patients completed at least two out of three IA treatments with 18 completing three IA treatments. Now you may say, John, why did some not complete? Host of reasons. There was voluntary removal. Remember, we do anesthetize these patients with general anesthesia. So some patients either voluntarily removed. Three patients had intratumoral bleeds, whether that was related to a bastard or not. They were not clinically significant. They were just MRI um, uh, paramagnetism. But in, as, out of a bunch of caution, because a bastard does have a um, a low but single digit bleed rate, those patients were taken out of the trial. So our uh, statistician, um, our statistical goals were 23 patients. We completed uh, that recruitment of 23 patients. As Michael, you said, this was essentially 2021 brain tumor classification glioblastoma patient population. They were 22 out of 23 patients were IDH wild type. And importantly, like that patient that I showed you, they had very high pre-treatment lesion volume. So the majority of these patients actually were deemed not gross total resection patients. And actually this trial was designed to treat these patients. I will tell you that these are the kind of patients that are routinely excluded from all of the trials because they have a large volume of disease. And of course, the, <clears throat> the molecular fingerprint is, is the poorest of the group. So, uh, Nitesh, thank you for uh, completing this paper. Um, we just um, published this this month, and here's the data. So, of our 23 patients, we have a median overall survival, again, of 23.1 months, progression-free survival of 11 months. Our three-year survival is 32.1%. 
and our five-year survival was 16%. This is a pretty poor population of patients. And again, like that guy above who's had a six-year survival, we have many examples of these cases like this, unresectable, uh, deep insular, dominant, um, infiltrative uh, GBM, 2021 GBM. And this is what we saw with this high-dose uh, treatment and, and long-term survival. So we are now, um, the FDA now has our phase three trial protocol, which uh, I hope Miami will be a, a part of. Fa the phase three trial will look at this treatment and randomize. Uh, randomization will be two to one, two uh, being uh, the experimental arm and one being STU protocol alone. So this treatment will be a, about a 300 patient treatment across six institutions, uh, Miami being one of them. And we will look at our primary endpoints and, and secondary endpoints listed here. So we're excited. Um, we submitted to the FDA approximately uh, two weeks ago. We're not just a one uh, pony show. Um, in addition to Bevacizumab, we've explored other monoclonal antibodies. I did my postdoc at, at Penn on EGFR signaling with Donald Rourke. And Cetuximab is a monoclonal antibody to uh, EGFR and um, <clears throat> it never penetrates the blood-brain barrier. We've studied, we've studied IV cetuximab uh, in glioblastoma and it woefully failed. Of course it fails uh, because <clears throat> it doesn't penetrate the blood-brain barrier. So we published on this before. Uh, Shamik, one of our residents wrote this up uh, showing that it's safe uh, to give intraarterial cetuximab. Cetuximab is a potent radio sensitizer. Um, and I'll talk about one of our residents at Cornell, Heather McRae, who you just mentioned in your uh, neurotrauma talk. But we have a whole host of other trials using selective intraarterial cerebral infusion of other drugs uh, for the treatment of GBM and actually head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Heather McRae was one of our residents at Cornell. She went up to Harvard to do a fellowship. And I love when people take our concepts and, and go do great things. Here she studied in an animal model. How do you get to tux about past the blood brain barrier? And of course, she, she publishes in Nature, and I publish in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, but nonetheless, um, she used hyperosmolar treatment uh, with mannitol. So again, if you want to get drugs into the, uh, into the brain, it's a safe and effective and, and cheap way uh, to get some of these monoclonals. We looked at DIPG, and I just want to touch on this because we just finished a trial uh, using this treatment for DIPG. We started looking at DIPG because of how beautiful the basilar artery was. So here you can see a, a pontine glioma. What Howard Wiener was able to show is that at the top of the basilar, you can blow up a balloon and basically look at D as in David on the bottom right. You can basically just blow um, <clears throat> flow into the ponds. And so I challenged once when I left um, Cornell, Heather McRae and Jeff Greenfield continued a trial for DIPG that I had opened there. And the trial is for children with DIPG and they combined our, our drug we were using with Bevacizumab and Cetuximab. And they published this this year, um, this month or last month, actually it was this month, um, where the combination of intraarterial delivery, delivery of Bevacizumab and Cetuximab is safe for DIPG. So I'm just so happy that we have shown in a trial in children and now a trial in adults that this is safe. And I, up, I leave it up to all of us to exploit this. This is a case we just did of a young girl from Dana-Farber who came down and was told she had nothing to do on the right um, is before her deep thalamic GBM. And she gave me permission to show, this is what Langer treated, you can see the catheter uh, tip, um, the, the cordial injections are sort of surrounding the tumor. He likes to call it the inside out approach, meaning that he believes the best way to get drugs is to get those terminal vessels that come deep into the brain, instead of coming over the top and trying to hit that peel supply, get that, it's almost like what Pierre Gauban used to do for retinoblastoma in the <clears throat> um, retinal artery. So she was hemiplegic with that thalamic tumor and literally 30 days afterwards, she's, she's like 19 or 20 years old. And um, this gets our patients off steroids right away. Here she is at Aruba six weeks later. 
yeah. uh, with her dad. So she was paralyzed on the left and uh, steroid dependent. And um, you know how many of these patients that we see. So her scan looks terrific. It looks exactly the same as it did uh, on that on that scan that I just showed you. And she's about six or seven months out. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one thinking about intra-arterial drug delivery. Um, Fred Lang is thinking about it. And as the chair at MD Anderson, he gave this uh, talk a couple of years ago. He is looking at intra-arterial drug delivery to give his uh, mesenchymal stem cell uh, oncolytic uh, uh, delta virus. So you have a means where we know the tumor is hijacking the blood supply. We have talented endovascular people. Um, it's my opinion, this is an easy and low risk way uh, to exploit this. So just to uh, summarize this part of um, the talk, I think we have a better understanding of the cancer stem cell hypothesis and this perivascular stem cell niche. We know that BEV disrupts the stem cell niche. We know that high doses are better. And we know that using mannitol to disrupt the blood brain barrier to give these drugs is safe now. We've shown it in adults and others, um, which keeps me sort of out of it um, with my uh, inherent bias, have shown that it's effective in children as well. And so we're now um, starting larger scale phase three trials uh, to, to randomize this. So I'm going to sort of spend the last couple of minutes on some other great, crazy ideas that I've had and <clears throat> to bypass the blood brain barrier. And this is sort of hot off the press. Here's a case of a head and neck cancer I did with one of our colleagues here, here at Lennox. And we harvested after we resected this squamous cell carcinoma. I saw them harvest a um, temporal parietal fascial flap, which is pedicle on the superficial temporal artery. And as I was har harvesting it, I realized that they can do a huge amount with these huge flaps. So here's a large temporal parietal fascial flap that comes from an extracranial source. And we use it to reconstruct the skull base to prevent osteoradiative necrosis, to prevent infection, to seal the skull base. So I hypothesized, why can't we put this into the surgical cavity in our patients in GBM and this become a conduit um, either for us to give uh, treatment to pay the microenvironment in GBM, all of this vascularity lacks a blood brain barrier. Maybe like in, we see in angiomatosis, this blood supply will lack a blood brain barrier and actually help us in our delivery mechanisms. So again, um, I think Nitesh, you may have made this uh, actual piece of art, but yeah. here's the idea. You, you have your brain tumor, you have your pedicle pericranial temporal parietal fascial flap, you remove the tumor and you put in your TPF flap. Here you can see another picture of it. Take out your tumor. You have this extra cranial supply of vascularity. You can then just sew it to the PIA and this will anastomose and actually seal down to the microenvironment. And all of these blood vessels will have lack of blood brain barrier. So believe it or not, we got approval to trial this in 10 patients. And I think Nitesh, this is your voice. I'm gonna actually in this fast short forward it. Video, we demonstrate our technique in the placement of the pedicle temporal parietal fascial flap into the resection cavity of a right frontal temporal glial parietal fascial flap. So I'm taking out a temporal brain tumor here quickly. And Plus after I do that, we're going to take our temporal parietal fascial flap TPF and actually sew it to the PIA. The field to assess fit. Operator should assess fit of the flap to ensure there will be minimal tension. A preliminary fitting is made that potential attack of points can be identified. So you can see the STA pulsing site. and then it gets so down. Check the STA to ensure flow. This can be performed with Doppler ultrasound easily intraoperatively. So this is being sutured down um, to the PIA just to hold it in place. And the idea now is you have this extra cranial supply of vasculature that would lack a blood brain barrier. And this is the closure. Basically you have to leave a hole in the bone flap, a hole in the dura, and you have this pedicle. Dudes um, maybe use the better sealed dural defect. The bone flap. 
So this is our, our last case I did last week, a large left frontal GBM. I take out the GBM, it, it's not really coming across that well, but this patient has a large TPF flap that's sewn to the um, cavity of that um, uh, resection cavity. Now, there are two things I hope to gain here. One is the blood supply now lacks a blood-brain barrier, and two, tumor-associated antigens may have a better time being surveilled uh, by the extracranial uh, immune system than the intracranial immune system. Here you can see a, big, a recent case I did where we have a big uh, temporal parietal fascia flap, and here it's actually tucked into the resection cavity, and you're sort of looking down the barrel of the resection cavity, okay? And so this trial is ongoing. This is how it comes out of the bone flap. Here on the left is how it comes out of the dura, and this is how it comes out of the bone flap. So we've enrolled Six out of 10 patients that the FDA gave me approval to enroll. Five out of six have not progressed to date. This is an upfront trial. One has passed a year and a half after uh, diagnosis. Interestingly, she progressed at a distal site. Her actual site where we put the flap um, has remained disease-free. So what are the risks of this? Obviously, putting anything on the brain can cause seizure, swelling. But you may ask, well, John, what if the tumor hijacks the vasculature and grows more quickly? It's possible, that would be interesting. What if the tumor grows along the, the vascular pedicle and actually we can actually coax the tumor to grow out of the brain as opposed to in the brain? That would be interesting. We've seen neither. Um, obviously it's early. Uh, there actually is some data on this. So I'm gonna end with this last idea. Once we had success with this rather simple temporal parietal fascial flap, I hypothesized that omentum is an even better source to bypass the blood brain barrier. And in looking at this, I went into the data and actually Mitch Berger is the only one that has exploited this idea. And he did it in a rabbit model in 1990. And I called Mitch, I said, Mitch, why do you give up on the rabbit model of a mental transposition to bypass the blood brain barrier? He goes, John, I just ran out of time and money. So no one has picked it up. So I decided to pick it up. And other people have used other tissue techniques to try to bypass the blood brain barrier, much like our TPF flap. But here's the idea. We all know that if you put omentum on the brain, it grows blood vessels as quickly as 12 hours. And guess what? All these blood vessels lack a blood-brain barrier. So why, why are we not using this as an extracranial supply of vascular um, inflow that lacks a blood-brain barrier? This is your omentum. It's massive. It's e easily harvestable. Um, it's highly vascular. Um, we used to pull it up for uh, mental cranial transposition for Moya Moya. I'll tell you what we do now. We do a free flap that's tied into a blood vessel in the neck, but this can show you the length of momentum. And fortunately, like I showed you on that original picture, our institution here at Lenox Hill with a very robust head and neck practice um, in cancer has a lot of experience in laparoscopically harvesting momentum. So Peter Constantino and his team routinely did, they've done about 70 uh, in the last uh, two years or so, where they can laparoscopically harvest on a mental free flap. And so this is really the slide that I want you guys to focus on, because I'm sure many of you don't remember that in addition to the vascularity in omentum, it's a lymphatic organ. They have more milky spots than any organ in the body. A milky spot is basically a, a cluster of immune cells. So by placing this into your tumor cavity, you may you may uh, be exposing tumor-associated antigens to endogenous antigen-presenting cells, B cells, T cells. So this was my latest idea. I was going to combine neurosurgery, head and neck surgery, and this general surgery approach, harvest this omentum from our patients with GBM, tie it into a facial artery and vein in the neck, and then plop this into my surgical cavity. So with a good clinical trials team, we applied to the FDA, and I'm not going to show you this whole video, but I'm going to skip the video Hello, everyone. and just go to our first case. So here's our first case, which we just completed about six months ago. Here's a recurrent GBM. This is for recurrent GBM. And here you can see a, a right posterior temporal um, occipital parietal GBM. The goal here is to take out this tumor, place an omental flap, stuff it into that area, give it her milky spots, and then actually through her vessel, we have access with our microcatheters to deliver any agent we want. I know it sounds a little Frankensteinian, but it's actually interesting. So here's our before and after film 
So here you see the, the enhancement in the right temporal lobe before, and exactly where my resection cavity is, is my omentum in the brain. And here's the pedicle going preauricular. So all I can think about is those milky spots just souping it up in there and having access to our tumor-associated antigens. This is our teams, Peter Constantino and, and uh, Bob Andrews, just an incredible team. And here is sort of the way we thought about it. Here's her craney incision. Here's where we're gonna anastomose the, instead of pulling it up, they do a laparoscopic couple of holes in the, in the abdomen, but this patient was, uh, gave us permission to tell her story. I know it seems kind of grotesque, but here you can see my resection cavity, a clean resection margin. And then while they harvest the omentum, I close the skin. So you can see the laparoscopic harvest of the omentum. They pull the omentum through the hole in the belly button. And you have this huge arcade now to, to basically um, shape this any way your resection cavity demands. Constantino will then um, isolate the artery and vein here. And actually, we actually look at the omentum with uh, uh, ICG to make sure there's good blood flow. Here's the abdominal holes, so it's not a huge operation. You can see here the anastomosis of the gastroepiploic artery to the facial artery and vein. So now you have a full... Um, you know, engrafted um, piece of omentum that's getting its own blood supply. So once we have that blood supply, I then take the omentum and you can see me see it here being placed into the surgical cavity. And we just close it over like we did for our TPF flap, close the dura, close the bone. And in front of the ear is where we have our anastomosis. So you now have this um, graft that is alive and well. This is her post-op CAT scan. We obviously were hyper cautious. You can see that there's no bleeding. This is her, here's us checking uh, the viability of her graft. Better have a pulse on her. And what's even more interesting, again, this is before is on the right and, and this is her uh, post-op scan on the left you can see it just matches her resection cavity. And then six weeks later, we're able to do an angio and this is what it looks like. So David Langer was able to put a catheter up into that vessel that we created, anastomosing the gastroepiploic to the facial artery and vein. And this is now accessible to us to treat the patient. The question is obviously she's part of a clinical trial so I can't treat her with anything else. Um, she's actually part of this safety trial, but this is, this is the first time it's ever been done in humans for GBM. And again, I can't emphasize enough, the goal here is to get milky spots. And this is one of her milky spots. We took one of her mental milky spots and this is what it looks like. This, these are in her brain now. T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, you name it. I, I never thought of, I can't think of any other way instead of like sprinkling lymph nodes or something. These are in her tumor cavity. So this is open for business. It's called laparoscopically harvested mental free tissue autograph to bypass the blood-brain barrier in a human recurring glioblastoma. So we have treated two patients to date. Uh, Fadi Charbel sent us a, a great physician from Texas uh, that we treated. He's doing great. He sent me a picture of himself rock climbing. So I just think that in summary, I like to look at things uh, in a new light. I think this is a horrible disease that um, obviously we have been, you know, throwing a bunch of great ideas at, but getting minimal progress. Um, I know this, particularly in, a, in the year and a half that we've had, from the moment I know this, there are sick people and they need curing. So we've had an incredible year. I think um, I'm looking forward to uh, exploiting these concepts. And as I say to all of our patients, clinical trials save lives. Our patients, 66% of our patients enroll in clinical trials. The national average is about 5%. Um, and what I say to them is what we know in every human disease, if you enroll in a clinical trial, you do better than patients who don't enroll in a clinical trial, even if you get a placebo. The placebo effect is real. The Hawthorne effect is real. And with that, I'll wrap it up. So thank you again. I really um, 
just excited about you guys having Nitesh and um, just forming a great collaboration between our two groups. Michael? Yeah, yeah, phenomenal work, uh, John. I mean, really, really interesting stuff. And, and it's, it's, it's about time we start thinking more outside the box uh, and really pushing the limits uh, because there's been over a thousand trials, clinical trials in GBM, and we've really made no progress. So it's, it's uh, the current, current theories are, are not working. Uh, I, I have two quick questions before we have a bunch of Q and A questions. But one was, you know, are you continuing with this with the normal stoop protocol in, in those patients with either the free flap or mental flap? Um, and are you uh, dosing or where the IV is placed in those patients? Are you doing anything special about placing the IV closer to the to the supply of that or no? No, the answer is no. So the way the FDA has always, you know, we I'm very sort of by the book and. Um, Every patient for the temporal parietal fascia flap, which is part of our newly diagnosed trial, gets standard of care with that. Um, there's no alteration um, from that. This is a safety trial. Um, so um, first and foremost, although one of our endpoints, which we're going to hit um, in December, I think, with our sixth patient, is we just have this the statistician, we, only, we have to show four patients have six-month progression-free survival, which we already have. Um, but the answer is they get standard of care with the TPF flap. And what, what your question is a good one for the omentum because that's out of the recurrent setting. And actually, they're allowed to get whatever treatment they want, meaning that, for example, the patient who came from Austin, Texas is getting, uh, I think, lomustine at recurrence. So there's some variability. But again, that's a secondary endpoint for us. Th this has never been done, Michael. And so just proving that it's safe and answering the basic questions. I think it's really important to answer the question to make sure that um, the tumor doesn't grow. You know, I'm giving the, I'm giving the tumor a highly vascular source. It'd be really yeah. interesting if the tumor doesn't hijack it. And even if it did grow along the, the source, you know, there's a lot of cancer biology where we're trying to coax cells to grow in tubes, you know, and, and move them away and just kind of, It'd be really interesting if we can actually coax them to grow out of the brain. And like, it's like pulling, uh, you know, a net, I don't know, I'm trying to use like a Miami reference, like maybe a net of like uh, seafood from the, uh, the ocean or something. Um, and, then, and then I want to ask you also with the Avastin trials, you know, uh, Manish Aghi, I was in his lab at UCSF, has done a lot of work with looking at uh, Avastin resistant um, cases and uh, in stem cells and also in patients. And, you know, he's really uh, kind of identified a couple of different subtypes of glioblastoma, specifically the mesenchymal subtype that have tended to be much more resistant than others. And uh, in your trial, uh, you know, in any of these cases that either present first time and then second time and they recur after Avastin, have you looked at to see if there's any change in the subtypes or or to understand, you know, what are, what is the resistance? Is there resistance happening? Is it different than when we do IV? Well, there's definitely, we definitely have failures and right. there's absolutely patients that they appear resistant to VEGF and, you know, that epithelial to mesenchymal transition, that EMT is deaf. What's interesting is that EMT is driven more by EGFR signaling than something like VEGF signaling. And so we've looked at this in, in brain tumors and lung cancer and whatnot. So the answer is no, we haven't. Um, and actually David Langer is looking at these failure cases. And the one thing he, you know, it's one thing to say, well, have they progressed because the basic biology, which is my guess, like you said, there's, there's definitely a, uh, you know, a, a component of these GBM patients that are mesenchymal and they may just have different cell signaling. What's, you know, what we can't do right now is we don't have good immunohistochemistry for VEGF in in our pathology labs, meaning that your neuropathologist is not routinely staining for VEGF, a soluble ligand in your tumors that you take out. Um, but your question is a great one. And I think that, you know, all of our patients are getting next, next gen sequencing. And I think with a larger trial, we're gonna have a lot more information. Great, uh, I see Dr. McRae has joined us and I, I wanted to give her since we quoted a bunch of her great work that you guys have done together and, and by herself, I just wanna give her the first chance to talk. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm thrilled to join in. I'm, I'm sorry I was a little late joining and thank you very much for the kind words. Um, I, I think I, I just wanna highlight one thing um, that John just mentioned in your question about the STOOP trial. I mean, 
and I really appreciate the mentorship. I mean, I learned to put together a clinical trial by working on the PEDS IA trial with John while he was still at Cornell when I was a resident. And it was a crash course in getting through IRBs um, with a lot of steps along the way. Um, but one of the things that he always drilled home was that any patient on a clinical trial should always get standard of care before the clinical trial. And that, you know, that's true on the adult trials. We put that in our pediatric trial for that reason. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who do clinical trials who don't do that, who they say, I want whatever's best for my trial. And it's a lot harder to figure out the endpoints if you allow them to enroll in other trials while they're going on. But he always drove home that that was the right thing to do to give the patients the best chance. Um, and I think, I think, you know, we don't always talk about that, but I think that's an important thing. Uh, to highlight, but really neat work. It's fun to see the progression over what's now been many years. Um, and I listen, uh, you know, so people, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm grateful that you took it over the, uh, the finish line as well. And I look forward to uh, our uh, Cohen's Children's Hospital participating in your trial. I've already talked to them about it, but um, you know, it's hard to get patients to consent. You know, people think it's easy, but they are obviously um, inherently uh, apprehensive. And we may have trouble actually getting patients to ran and many, many clinical trials have trouble enrolling patients. If there's a control arm who wants to get a control, um, especially when there's data out there suggesting that the treatment that you're being offered may actually work. And so it, we have a host of issues, um, in, in consenting. And I just always felt two things very strongly, no financial interest in any trial that I've ever run never will. And also making sure that, that there is scientific rationale for the control group to have a really good chance to respond to the control and making sure that they understand that uh, there are crossover designs and other ways for patients uh, to have access. Great. Uh, and then Tesh, you want to, any questions? If not, then we could maybe get through some of the Q and A's. Yeah, I figured we get through some of the Q and A's. I'm you know, I think uh, we have a bunch of questions that came in, I think, from a bunch of people. I was trying to answer some of them. Okay, yeah, why don't you go through those unless Dom and, and uh, Dr. Cater have any questions. Uh, I just had a quick question. If Do you feel that, you know, using this method in conjunction with uh, focused ultrasound would improve the results or if it's, you know, you're already disrupting the blood-brain barrier with the mannitol, why, why add in another costly uh, tr uh, treatment modality? Um, I stood up, I, I gave a, um, you know, a talk at the CNS, uh, at the brain tumor update. And after Jason Sheehan gave his focused ultrasound talk, I said, Jason, it's time for us to come together, you know, like, uh, like Congress or something. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're absolutely right, Michael. That's, that's what needs to be done. So what we need to do is actually, and Heather, this is something that we should think about, particularly for you, because um, much like Mark was targeting the, the ponds, Michael, you're absolutely right. Slide the patient into a maggot, magnet, give them you know, micro bubbles, disrupt the blood-brain barrier using MRI-guided focused ultrasound, and then have your microcatheter there to give whatever drug is, is that you want. It's a home run. And you may say, John, why haven't you done it? Because I left when my caplet got the MRI, got a focus ultrasound at Cornell. And then um, it's just been, we haven't gotten it here at Northwell yet. We've talked about it, but it's a two and a half million dollar lift. And it just, somebody, and you know, I've talked to Graham Woodward at, at Maryland, who's doing some things. So it's all yours. I mean, anyone and everyone should be thinking about it. If you have an MRI, got a focus ultrasound, come, you know, enroll, participate in our phase three trial now so that when you can do the, those together michael you're answering a really good question for dipg for any any brain lesion it's a great concept mannitol is dirty mannitol is dirty and i got to focus ultrasound as long as it disrupts the blood brain barrier i think that that data is being you know delivered now no uh, but mannitol i i love that concept thank you Tom, anything Eric Bufar, thanks. That was a great talk and you know, a lot of exciting ideas and, and overlaps with a lot of you know my personal interests as well. Um, interesting, do you think um, you know, 
that would benefit from a combination of intraarterial and systemic uh, delivery of bevacizumab because you know I, I worked with a uh, Herb Weisman back in you know, I was an undergrad in cancer stem cell theory and saw that you can actually recruit pericytes from the bone marrow so there is like a systemic recruitment of these um, you know factors and and cells to the the local tumor niche so in addition to locally blocking it would you think of giving systemic as well to kind of give a, a, a two hit or, or you think the intraarterial gives the, the, the most- No, uh, it's delivery? a very good question. The reason, let me just jump on a concept that you brought up. The reason why I think in the Avaglio IV bevacizumab trial failed for newly diagnosed is two reasons. One, you're giving IV bevacizumab every other, every other week with standard of care. So there are two things that happen at that point. One, you're, pressuring the cell and you're showing the cell and the body bevacizumab every two weeks. So that leads to higher complication rates, proteinuria, you know, wound healing issues. And two, you basically just took out the surgeon from that patient's disease. By giving that patient IV bevacizumab every two weeks, you remove the surgeon from any recurrence essentially. And that alone is a reason why I think our intraarterial BEV alone is the way to go. I can reoperate on these patients and I do reoperate on patients. And frankly, that may be the reason why they're living longer is because I get a second and third crack at them because they're not stuck on IV Avastin. I don't have to wait four or six weeks. I don't have wound breakdown issues. Those patients haven't seen IV BEV. We published a paper, Dominique, that you can actually re-challenge years later, months later, once you're done with IA Bev, it's like their body hasn't even seen it. You can rechallenge with IA, IB Bev at any time you want. So keeping that body naive, I think, is important. Now, yes, you're right. You lose some of that systemic suppression of the bone marrow or transition, but I think you get it locally with high doses of Bev in the brain. I'll, I'll add one thing too. I mean, I yeah. think it's interesting to see the difference between the IV and the IA response. Um, we had one pediatric patient that we treated twice. Um, it, our, our trial was just a one-time dose and now we're hoping to move into repeat dosing. And she had IA, BEV and Cetux with a really good symptom response for about a month. And then because they were allowed to get any therapy, the treating oncologist gave IV BEV. She had zero symptom response. And then we gave another dose of IA, Cetux and BEV and she once again had a symptom response. So I don't know whether that's because of it being the higher dose from the intraarterial or the mannitol blood brain barrier breakdown, or if actually she was more responsive to the Cetux rather than the Avastin, but mm. definitely the IV Bev did not show anywhere near the same, any response for her, um, whereas the IA Cetux and Bev did. So I, I thought that was interesting. We don't obviously have enough patients to know if that's a general trend, but. And then um, uh, one question about the uh, um, grafting uh, study, which I think is, is extremely cool. Uh, did you compare angiograms between the, the pericranial graft and the omental graft to see you know, if timing one is, is more potent than the other or kind of happened than that had to So happen the answer is no. In fact, we've only done one of the omental graft. And remember that artery anastomosis is a new art, you know, arterial and venous anastomosis, the temporal parietal fascial is, uh, we don't have to do any anastomosis. And I actually think there's a question whether we need to actually, do we need to actually tie in the omentum? What if we just put omentum in the brain itself? How much will live? You know, it's all a question of, you know, in vascular neurosurgery, it's about demand, right? Do you want to create demand on the omental graft? You know, by giving it its own artery and vein, maybe we're not creating the demand we need uh, for it to get into the brain. Maybe if we don't give it an arterial supply, the demand will allow it to insinuate into the brain. So, you know, I don't have answers to this question. I just wanted to show the concept and that the technical feasibility should be exploited. And um, it's actually, you know, safe. If we can show safety, I think uh, we can do some interesting things down the road. Great. Thanks. Natesh, you want to just uh, get through some of those questions real quick? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of good ones here. Um, I answered a few already, but um, uh, David uh, Mazur Hart asked a, a simple but important question uh, regarding these graphs, um, especially for the pedicled ones or non pedicled ones, regarding anticoagulation aspirin uh, for these patients post op. So, obviously, graft, you know, we all worry about grafts not surviving, whether you're doing a, you know, a, 
you know, with Langer doing MCA bypass or uh, any of these anastomosis. So for the first five days, we're, we're aggressively checking Q our Doppler ultrasound um, of our uh, mental cranial graft. Um, we don't routinely anticoagulate. I mean, there's no contraindication to it, but um, we're not, at least in, in our early studies, there's no role for anticoagulation. Great. Um, and then another question we had from, uh, it's actually going off to a little bit what you said earlier regarding your work with O'Rourke and CAR T cells. Um, you know, Laura could have asked, you know, uh, what are your insights or theories on how what you've talked about today sort of goes along with CAR T therapies for glioblastoma and um, et cetera? Look, I think what Don is doing with uh, CAR T and EGFR, look, you're going to, you're going to take out these patients, um, you know, T cells, engineer them to whether attack EGFR, HER2, whatever you want. Um, the question is, do they get into the brain in meaningful doses? I don't know if you've seen Michael Lim uh, show a slide where you need, a, you know, you need 100 T cells to kill one cancer cell. And so we know, I hope that, you know, if, if Don wants to use our pedicle and, you know, put CAR T cells in there, great. But the idea of actually transplanting endogenous milky spots into the microenvironment in the tumor cavity is kind of like mind altering to me. I, I kind of, I asked my general surgeon, can you like squeeze the omentum and like get just the milky spots out for me? And then I can like make it into a soup and like a, like a tartar sauce and put it in, in, but this is just obviously uh, some interesting concepts and, uh, but yeah, you're, you know, look, all of these things at some point, the problem is Don is doing his car T thing, right? I'm doing my own mental thing. You're doing this. And so-and-so is doing this. Like in order to over, it's just so hard to overlap. In fact, Heather would know this. Um, Heather was probably at the barbecue that Howard Rena had at his house as a resident when we even talked about intraarterial drug delivery. And it's just because we had such a close relationship. I had no idea what they were doing in the neurovascular community. He has no idea. And David has no idea what we're doing in the neuro-oncology community. And yet it took us kind of walking each other through it to redo this attempt. And I think it's going to, I think it's going to bear fruit. I really do. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. I have any other questions or anything like that? No, no, no. I think that, I think that's great. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you again so much. This is really uh, thought provoking and, and exciting to get all the young minds working on this and, and trying to take the next step in the right direction. So keep us updated on, all right, on, thank the, you. on how everything's going. And then uh, I'll send you our phase three protocol once we hit the uh, hear from the FDA. Yeah, please do. Please do. All right. Thank you guys so much. It's great seeing you all. Old and new, fresh faces. Have a great holiday season. Sure to be safe. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.